What surfing really did for me, I think it, it woke up and released the real, the real me. A lot of the environment that I was brought up in, you know, I was stifled uh, as, as a young kid, being a dark kid in a, in a white area. I started surfing in the summer of 66, 67 down at Warrnambool. This is my 50th year of surfing and I've probably shaped between 25 to 30,000 boards over 45 years. I was always timid and just felt always a little bit different, a little bit, a little bit out of left field somewhere. I never felt comfortable until I started surfing. At 18, you know, I became in touch with a guy called Wayne Lynch, who then opened up a, a world to a lot of, you met Nat Young and met all these photographers. And so that early 70s period, then I won a couple of Victorian championships, made an Australian team, and then all of a sudden, bang, uh, I got busted for possession. And in 1974, spent 22 months reporting to the police every day. I pleaded guilty because I did a, a plea bargain that I was just to be put out on a bond because I'd already virtually done two years. And uh, they decided in their infinite wisdom to give me four years with a three year minimum, which meant I had to serve two years and a big part of that was in a maximum security jail. I learned by the newspaper that I'd been stripped of my title. The effect it had on me was very, very, very negative. I didn't believe in anything anymore or surfing. I asked my, uh, my wife and family not to visit me anymore. I went to a very, very hard place. And part of that was for survival. I was to try and cut myself off from the world and just do my jail time. I came out very vulnerable, but very angry and probably pretty aggressive. You know, I'd back it up, you know, big time. I was diagnosed about eight years ago having a PTSD uh, and that I'd been carrying, basically being depressed for, <laughs> well, how long is that, 35 years, 40 years or something. So that in itself was a journey. And you know, a lot of people go, oh, that's really heavy. And I go, yeah, but I made good friends that showed me a, di a different side of life. And if anything, you know, I did turn that negative into a positive. It took a long time. It didn't, wasn't just a year. Like when I came out, I was uh, pretty crazy to say the least. Like, so I was always carrying this very, very dark side with me, you know, and it's, you know, I still suffer from it now. You know, I live with depression. You know, everyone, ah, oh, it's just depression. You don't realize that it's a fight every day. I was a dark kid which meant until I was 12 years old, any dark kid in Australia was considered subhuman. They didn't have the right to vote. They weren't considered humans. So I subconsciously was carrying a lot of that. All of a sudden surfing came along and none of that mattered. All that really mattered was, was wow, here's this thing that I can do really, really well. And it doesn't matter about anybody else except the ocean. So this relationship started between me, nature, mother nature, the ocean, and that brought out the very, very best in me as a person. It allowed me to develop my, my character, my persona, probably a little bit unchecked sometimes, but uh, you know, you, you, may, you trial and error a lot. But really, when you boil it down, <laughs> um, that moment, that first wave, changed my life forever and I'm a lot better person for it and I think people around me have learned to understand that some of my early years I was a very troubled person and no, I, I still have troubles I still you know have doubts and all of that but I seem to be able to contribute a lot lot more back to people whereas in the early days I was just sitting there just like this unnurtured little kid who was just hanging out and wondering where his place in the world was going to be. And this just big door swung open uh, through standing up on a surfboard and riding a wave. Everything that's good about me today came from surfing and family.
I probably go to Bell's two to three times a day, sometimes four times a day, even when there's no surf. I like to think that the truth always comes through. And if you live, live your life true to yourself, boy, surfing will look after you. And then if you, if you, if you get a bit cocky and you think you're, you're greater than you are, well, just go in the ocean and you'll get your ass kicked. You know, you'll get bitch slapped by Mother Nature. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That leads into our next guest. It's, uh, it's one of the better introductions, a lot better than my introduction, playing an epic video like that. Welcome to the Really Good Radio Morning Show, Morris Cole. Thanks, mate. How are you? I'm, I'm really... It's early. It is early. It is early. I do understand uh, some people don't get up this early and, and do their uh, get on radio as one of their first things. But um, I'm I'm honoured that you're here, mate. I'm honoured. Oh, mate, it's 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 a bit of a joy to be here. Let's mate, get some messaging out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, I saw you smiling towards the end of that. That watching that back, and you're wriggling around a little bit. I always. No one else can see that part, but what were you thinking when when you, that little wry smile comes on your face and you're looking at yourself? <laughs> what were you thinking? It's 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 actually a smile of joy, you know. It's it's realizing how far you've come, what you've gone through, dealing with what you've gone through. Like, just so you know, uh, you probably don't know this. I'll fill you in a little bit, and, and the people out there. Yeah, I got diagnosed with having cancer again for the third time the day before Christmas last year. So instead of doing Christmas Day, I had to have a shot of these horrible hormones to try and stop this tumour, which is the third time I had it back. So it knocked me on the back most of January, um, and I, it was a pretty fast-growing tumour anyhow. So mm. then the pandemic came along. Then I had some side reactions. Then I was locked up in home for a, about a month because I was having quite a lot of trouble. Uh, it looked like I was on the way out and I'd sort of taken the decision that, you know what? Oh, I think I'm, I think I'm done I, again. So I've, I've nearly died. I've added it up 19 times now. I've been dodging bullets for a long time. <laughs> Literally sometimes, yeah, but... Really, what, what happened was there was a bit of a miracle. Um, the tumour disappeared. I had some really bad physical side effects, which really incapacitated me, which thought I, I thought I was dying. But long story short, it just disappeared again. Wow. So it's really made me sit up. It just disappeared, you know, like with possibly with some hormones. I had a couple of miracles, just so everyone knows out there. I am a practicing Christian. Um, and um, just a miracle happened. The bloody thing disappeared. So instead of looking at probably not being here in the next maybe couple of months, mm. looks like I've got 10 years, which was rather a, a really wake up when, when you look at the spectrum of my life and what I've been through, and all of a sudden I find myself uh, uh, 11 weeks after I found out that I'd beat this cancer, Bell's Beach came under threat again. They were mm. trying to develop Bell's again. And, uh, and then I went, who are they? And then I realised one day I was at, at this panel meeting, this Gorsak, it's some great ocean road, something or other, you know, it's just another one of these bureaucracies <laughs> anyhow. Oh, the bloody bureaucracies, mate, anyhow. So all of a sudden I realised, I, uh, I looked at Darren, who was next to me, He's, he, he deals with a lot of issues, community issues for Surf Rider. And I just looked at him and I said, I've had enough. I'm going to run for council. But I'm, I'm going to run for council a little bit different. And he's just going, what about your health? What about your health? And I've gone, well, and this is part of the, the evolution, I think. It's, I said, well, it, someone's got to do it. And it feels like I've been, been given the job of trying to break the back of a politicised council. We've had a Labor council. We've had a Labor CEO. And we've just found out through all our freedom of information stuff and that the developers 
go to the state government, they lobby there, then they get sent down to the CEO, then the council officers actually facilitate the developers, then the report comes in for council to rubber stamp, and then there it is. It's just this corruption of process and system, you know, mm -hmm. and by, by the politicisation. So in actual fact, us as a community, when I talk community, I sort of talk community, I'd like to think it's family too, mm. that we've got no one to represent us. So what I did was I went and talked to a whole bunch of other candidates and it looks like we might take counsel and we're all of the same opinion. We need to get in there. We need to change. If we're going to change, let's change the world. Mm. Let's start. Let's start by having this really unique sort of view and going, wow, imagine a council that actually worked for the community first and foremost and not their political masters, whether it be Liberal, Labor. They're, to me, they're all the same. They're, you know, they've got, their, they've got their pluses, but there's a hell of a lot of minuses that come on, along with it. And one of the things is, is that we've had rampant development here on Surf Coast. Um, we've tracked it back now. We've, we've busted them. We've stood for council. We'll find out in about 10 days whether or not we've got a completely independent council with no political affiliations. Mm. We will then pick a like-minded CEO. We'll then clean out some of the Surf Coast Shire officers that are part of a, an old political system mm. and bring back the council to the community where first and foremost we represent the community and we will fight the state governments and the federal governments for the best deal we can get for the community how about that for a <laughs> how about that for a bit of weirdness eh? uh, anyhow so you did in amongst all of that so i have to be honest and up front here um hey, that's my health has suffered again uh okay. i've got some uh some signs already that i'm un stress and you know i really don't know like if, if i get elected as a councillor i'm putting it out there i'm being totally honest i'm not sure my health will let me do it but mm -hmm. i'll give it a crack but uh you know i'm looking possibly looking at a fourth tumor and a few people have said you're mad you're crazy and i just go well it's just not all about me it's about what I can do. It's about, you know, I've got grandkids, I've got kids, and it, it feels so much better to give than take. And that's something that has really resonated with me in the last, oh, 10, 15 years, you know, maybe 20 years. It's slowly been evolving inside me. So I've sort of, uh, yeah, that's an update with where I'm at today. You mentioned a little bit of that in, your, in that video, about um about how you've started to understand that it's about giving back um you're still doing a similar thing you're still hitting the waves you still love the surf but you've turned it away from yourself what was your some of your earlier years that you were you weren't like that what, what were they like and um you met a great guy oh. in wayne lynch you know obviously glenn casey um, yeah, you the, knocked around with some great crew in the it. 70s what was surfing like in the 70s oh mate the 70s was outrageous. We were pushing frontiers. We were, you know, we were smoking joints all day, every day mm. because, you know, it was illegal. We grew long hair because it was, you know, unacceptable. <laughs> we lived a lifestyle that was based on, we had no surf reports. Yeah. And we basically got up every day and if we had a bit of work on or something, you know, like, um, sorry, the surf's good today. No surf reports. You couldn't plan anything. So we were a bunch of desperados. It was, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And during the day we surfed, you know, mm -hmm. it was pretty wild. The eighties were wild, really wild. Cause I lived in, I, went, I moved to France. I made oh, wow. the Australian team to go to France, uh, the surfing team. And then, uh, landed in this place called Hossegore in the, the southwest of France and that became my home for 15 years and that's where the kids were born. So France was an unbelievable mm. life experience. Um, they accepted me. They didn't care whether I was a little bit eccentric. 
Um, <laughs> but we were the wild child, you know. It was it was a really wild, wild era, you know. It was like the Wild West. But it wasn't just self-indulgence. Mm. It was about pioneering. It was frontiers. We were making boards. We were redesigning boards. We were finding surf. We were finding surf spots that didn't look surfable, but with the equipment changes, we could. Mm. So I was part of that whole revolution in designing um, you know, I think I'm considered probably in the top three designers in the world. There's not too many people that are out there pushing the limits like I am with design and, you know, with tow boards and, you know, got a great friend with Ross Clark Jones where we've towed massive surf, tested boards, uh, brought those boards back, the design back to to the everyday surfboard. So it's been an incredible journey, you know. That's that's why I was sort of a little bit sad when I went, wow, I've only got about 12 months to go. What do I do? You know, what do you do when you think you've got 12 months? But then all of a sudden, six months later, they go, oops, <clears throat> instead of going left, uh, we're going to be going right now and you've got another decade or so. So that's really, that's really, really woken me up and that's why I ran for council to, to, to try and implement permanent change. Mm. You know, and that's what I try and do with a lot of people, and that's why I do shows like this. It's about you know, I've I've been through so much shit that people should be able to look at me and go, "Wow, my problems aren't that bad." If he can do it at his age, well, surely I can do it. So I like to always bring along hope. It's a, a know, thing that, that I hope. I was talking about this. Uh, I played your, your video to my mother last night. Just saying, you know, if you don't get up at seven thirty, this is what's going to be played before we speak to him, and uh, and we were talking about that exact same thing about saying uh, it's important that you might not f- be able to f- follow identically the decisions that these people make, but you can at least be reminded that the only reason that he's still here is that he didn't give up, and you can't you can't give up. There's hope. There's there's other, there's other ways to do life than what you think's in front of you, and uh, it's a credit credit well, to you man well no it's it's everybody everybody has choices you know like mm. you have the choice when you get up in the morning you know like what's today going to be like and you can get up and watch the news and you you know if you're not it, it can really affect you negatively so it's finding out which choices mm. things are never the same every day is different and it's your choice to make it better or worse and I sort of live by that. I have days, hey, I have days, I get to the end of some days, I'm so damn depressed by things, I have to come home and sit in my room for 14 hours, you know, mm-hmm. and sleep and stuff. So I still suffer, but I know how to deal with it. And I know how to deal with a lot of the dark thoughts and the negativity, you know. Uh, prayer always pulls me up and mm-hmm. just, just sets me back on track again. And that's mm-hmm. just something that's, I've into my life in the last 10 years. That journey is amazing. It's not finished. Uh, you mm. know, I'm trying to be a, a very, very, very good person, mm. but there, I have my moments, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, the depression side of thing is I'm one of those people when I'm pushed that uh, I can have uh, mine get, my depression goes to anger. Mm. And I, I'd like to think I could blame jail, but it's probably a little bit more than that. That the way you the way you fix things is through violence. And I've been a violent person. Mm. I've been a very violent person. To some people. I mm. always like to think they deserved it because that was usually they were bullying. So mm. I've always jumped in if I've seen someone bullying someone else because I was bullied as a kid. But. It's just not the answer. All it does is yeah. you just feel terrible after it, you know. Mm. You feel mm. shocking mm. if you've hit someone or anything like that. So I've got a whole journey of trying to mm. keep myself on track, trying to not have so many psychotic uh, breakdowns, you know, like where that's hard in the water, you know, being having been the top dog and I'm just trying to get out. There's people don't know who you are. It's a bit of a shit fight out there sometimes. <laughs> you know, you know. I've had some things said to me in the water that, uh, yeah, it pushes buttons, and it's how to control 
pushing those buttons. Did you just I'm say? Sort of, I'm just quietly <laughs> tiptoeing around a subject here. That, that, <laughs> That's uh, okay. That's okay. Yeah. Did you say people some, people? some people don't know you on the water. It's just the young whippersnappers that are coming in and. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Haven't no, been. We've, we've got a lot of people who surf now, you know, and I've yeah. surfed bells my whole life, and mm. you know they're still trying to develop it. They're still trying to put things up and. Mm. Mm. You know, we're in the middle of a huge, huge fight right now, you know, because they, the, the WSL, which is a World, World Surf, Surf League. League, want to build this big viewing platform at Winky Pop in case they use it during the, the Easter Pro. They need a place for their VIPs. So we're fighting hand, tooth and nail. And it's through that that we've discovered basically the politicisation of council and the council officers mm. and that they work for Spring Street and not the community. So turning a negative into a positive, mm. I've warned them all, warned them all and going, just leave Bells alone. Let us have our men's shed, which is now a men's and women's shed. There's so many of our daughters surf. There's right. so many mums surfing. There's young girls, young boys surfing. I mean, and just leave it alone because mm. we're dug in. We're dug in there. We're not going anywhere. It's say to the politicians. You guys, can go. we don't remain. We remain the same. I've got my son who I'm not sure if you know about, Damien. No, I haven't. He ran for the election in the state federal. He fought for the bite. He's got a, I think he's got, a, he's got something different in his genes too, a bit like his old man. <laughs> My daughter does too. She works for the Cotton On Foundation. She yeah, works yeah. with a lot of Aboriginal communities in Arnhem Land. So the whole family, uh, you know, we're more about what we can give, you mm -hmm. know, and part of this whole thing with Bells has been that what can I give? What can cope with that? I'm affectionately known and I call myself the old fossil. It's just <laughs> nice to recognise it. You know, some people call me uncle. Well, people look uh, for fossils. You know, people spend I'm a lot of time scurrying for fossils. Uncle fossil, you know. Yeah, I've been called a hell of a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Is your mob... I'm just coming back. Is your mob up in... Hey? Up, is your mob up Darwin, up our spirit Arnhem Land, did you say? Where, no, where's your connection no, from? Mate. Listen, listen. Well, that whole thing is it's unresolved because there's mm. not enough strong enough DNA pool. But I finally found my mother after 30 years because I was adopted right. uh, when I was a baby and um, adopted to a white family. But uh, as you can see, I don't really pass the Aryan German <laughs> test, do I? Or the German Aryan <laughs> test, you know? So I finally met my mother and she's this dark little lady, about five foot one. Wow. And she just so dark and, and just looks like me. So all we've been able to do is track down her father, yeah. which we don't know who he is. And we've got a, 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 I mean, she's always been considered, she went to New Zealand a lot. She was taken as a Maori, you know. Anywhere I travel, I can go anywhere. And I'm sort of got that chameleon look, except <laughs> in Germany. <laughs> I don't go down to go to the blondes and that. So I'm in, I'm in a place, I'm in a really strange place and um, uh, where I've got a lot of Aboriginal friends and mm. elders and I've always been attracted to that. And I think there's something naturally in there, but, you know, I've been accepted by a lot of different mobs all yeah. around yeah. Australia. I've been pretty active in Indigenous, Indigenous affairs. We're trying to hold an event next year. Um, the Australian Indigenous titles, that's still to come, but it looks like we're going to get backing. Brilliant. And bring bring down and not just have a surfing contest, but have an arts festival. Mm, mm. You know, we've got a lot to learn from Aboriginal culture. I'm still learning from a, some friends of mine mm. who uh, a good friend of mine. If you're out there, Gordon, he'll know who you are. But he's he actually helps. There's a there's there's a mob that live a thousand kilometres east, thousand mile east, thousand kilometres, something like that, of Kalgoorlie. Okay. And they're they're untouched, and there's just been an there's a, just an amazing story about how the community still works out there. You know, they're still in their their natural their natural natural state. Mm -hmm. And what it sort of showed was, I get a little bit emotional when I talk about this because it's sort of it just amazes me. And we've got so much to learn from Aboriginal culture. 
And this is one of the things. Gordon was out there one time, and there's a community of 300. There's 90-year-old guys with six-packs. Mm. Like, they can run and hunt at 90. At 73, they look 30 or 40 years of age. They haven't been poisoned by sugar and all those things, you know, and all the, the crap that we seem to get involved in. But more amazingly is the social structure. That there was one time he was sitting on the veranda with this 73-year-old. And he said, it's like he's like Jesus. He's so wise, this guy. So all of a sudden, a kid steals a car and he does burnouts around the camp. And the, the, the kid, finally, the whole community's come in. They're on their verandas. And uh, all of a sudden, Gordon's watching and said, what's going to happen? And he said, wait, wait, wait. So finally, the car ran out of petrol. The kid gets out of the car. Two elders walk over and they beat the shit out of him. And he goes, wow, that's pretty heavy. And he said, oh, no. He said, he said it could have been worse if the women get a hold of him with the nulla nullas, they break bones. It's really heavy shit, you know. And he mm. and I said, well, what about the parents? And he goes, well, the community has first right over the kids. And the parents have second right. So mm. you're part of a big family that, that is actually you're looked after by the whole community. So it's always stable. And then, then he, turn, he turns to Gordon and goes, we really don't understand you wingmen. And he said, sorry, wingmen? He said, you mean white men? He says, no, 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 you win men. He said, why do you have to win at everything? Everything, you've got to win. You've got to be better than someone else. You've got to win all the time. And it's lessons mm. like that mm. that make you mm. think, wow, community, family, you know, comes first. Mm. Oh, wow, this whole... You know, we used to call it keeping up with the Joneses. Now there's selfies, there's social media, mm. and there's all the problems that come along with, oh, I've got to show you my best 10 seconds mm. of the day and go on Instagram or Facebook or, you know, whatever you use, whatever social media you're using. Mm. So there's really important lessons, and that's why I've, I've been really involved in trying to get this, this contest up and going next year. And it's not going to be a contest. You know, we have a vision of, of a, just getting the kids down there, bringing mm. them from all over Australia mm. and having an arts. I think it goes, we can do Tuesday till Friday. Then why don't we all do something and go to Melbourne and uh, join Longy in the march to the MCG? <laughs> yeah. How would that be as a community it's and great. kids and get them buses? And, mm. So it's being able to sort of visualise and conceptualise and mm. outside the box a little bit. Um, and that's what I sort of bring because I've had so many different experiences in life. I've, you know, we, we've had, uh, we had an amazing thing about, I think it was 20 years ago where when I was, I used to, I love Hawaii. It's like a second home. You know, I first went there in 73 and I saw all these black fellas running around called the wines and they ran the joint, you know, so that was a real woke up. So we did a, an amazing uh, thing where we brought over about 20 Aboriginal dancers, everything mm. like that, and we had a cultural exchange program, which meant we went surfing with yeah. the hui, uh, with all the, the black shorts over there, and we just shut down beaches and had the best 10 days you've ever seen. I you can know? imagine that would have been unreal. Just try, huh? So, been unreal. you know. Uh, I've got a question. Yo. Sorry, Morris. I've got a question. Some of the, some questions on the chat, which is great. It's the whole whole point of going live is so people can get access to you. Uh, Robin Scott asked, um, "When does uh, what does real community engagement mean to you?" Um, real real community engagement is it, it's like fa you've got to understand who the community is and what the community is. And what we've had down here is we've had a surfing community. Mm. And it's becoming more and more fragmented. I would say that because there's a little bit of an us and them. There's the old mm. surfers, the young surfers. It seems to be human nature. Mm. So community to me is is bring when anything good or bad happens, it's really good to do it with people, with community, with family. And when you understand what the community values are, like. In surfing, it's pretty easy. We'd like a clean ocean. We'd like, we'd like to retain our lifestyle, uh, our young culture of surfing, which is about sixty years old here. So it's being able to represent that in the future, in in, in the future of our community, and using that as the foundation 
to make sure that we get checks and balances in place where we we actually represent the community. Like it's really hard to say, oh, how do you represent the community? Oh, it's pretty easy. I'm a surfer. And the surf community here has been really strong. But as you know, we're, we're getting so much development here mm-hmm. and it's been unmitigated development that there's a sense that, that there's a sense of community fragmenting a little bit right now. Yeah. So yeah. that's community for me is just family and, and being able to re- represent it at a political level. Wow. You know, this, this, is, this, this is hopefully going to be what we've got coming up with the council, that we do have a community-based council. It's always been ours. We've just taken it back and hopefully we've created a, a formula for other coastal communities that are under threat from development that you can take back your council. Yeah. Brilliant, mate. Thanks. That was uh, long-winded. That's great. No, that's what we're here for, mate. And, and uh, we've got another question here. Uh, do you do anything else uh, other than surfing for therapy? A therapy and prayer. I play music. Oh, yeah, cool. I play music. Um, I help uh, a lot of people behind the scenes. Uh, I don't, yeah, I've got a lot of kids that I help uh, through personal experience. When they call me, everything else has failed, um, <clears throat> which means that, you know, I've got to go in there and, and talk about drug addiction and, and talk about where, what's your life about, where are you going? Um, I, I'm always open to interviews like this because it's not about really about me. It's about me using, I guess, my fame and my experiences to help people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, you can, (laughs) you can virtually pick any bloody subject, you know, (laughs) I've got a story. I can tell, I can tell that it's great. My therapy is music, family, uh, and there's there's always a challenge, you know. There's there's always every day there's some, some issue comes up, some challenge comes up, mm. you know, it, whether it be mental, physical, mm. business, or something like that. To me, there's just constant there's a constant flow of negativity, mm. and I just go, come on, come on, bring it on, bring it on, because if there's negativity and problems. <laughs> There's going to be a solution there. And how good is it being a part of the solution? So in a certain way, mm. that's a therapy. Yeah. is giving back. And, it make, and you see other people, you know, and you cry with other people, you know. You, you, you feel other people's pain, you know. And I, I'm actually able to talk to kids on their same level. Oh, there's adults too. Um, you know, like I, I understand depression better than most people and where it will take you and how low you can go. I mean, you know, I've, I've literally been in the, the gutter of life, just struggling to, to, to stay alive. You know, there's been, there's been moments, you know, quite a few over the years where suicide seems an, a really easy option. But it's, it's sort of, and I can't criticise anybody because I know what those dark voices can do and how low they can drive it. And when I hear people say, oh, he didn't care, look at the way he killed himself or she killed herself, that's just a really, really, that, that, that's just not understanding how, how the mind can get so dark to where you believe that you shouldn't be here anymore and you're doing the world a favour by leaving us, you know. So there's that, and then there's obviously the anger from from depression, you know, mm. and that's something to really easy see. It's the other ones. It's the quiet killer where someone in their head is smiling at you, that they're smiling and talking to you, and in their head they're in a very, very, very dark place. And it takes professionals, it takes mm. good professionals because there's, there's some pretty average counsellors and psychiatrists out there too. So, you know, I've been incredibly lucky that I was with a counsellor in Western Australia about 20. I had a huge breakdown and um, this Jenny Monson saved my life. And she unravelled my whole life. 
like down to a kid and the darkest thoughts. So we'd have a two hour session every week for 22 months. And um, the first hour I would cry for an hour, cry for the kid, cry for all the pain I'd been through. And then the, the next hour was how to deal with it and rebuild. Mm. It was it was amazing. I still have to cling to a lot of those principles today. Yeah, uh, so therapy's mm. very a very broad very broad thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's 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 great for people like uh, this is my mother by the way that asked that question. She she battles a bit of um, bipolar and depression and and is always looking for ways you know alternative. So it's brilliant that you shared. I've got another question. Um, uh, and it probably touches on your creativity. What makes you make surfboards? Uh, not a lot of surfers yeah. end up surfing and then go, you know what, I'm going to make my own board. They just prefer someone else do it, grab it off the rack and speak to the maker. But what makes for a bad surfboard is the question. <laughs> a bad surfboard. Yeah, how can you? Hey, yeah. I've, never been, I've never been asked that question before. Look, a bad, a bad, a bad surfboard. Yes, there is such a thing. It doesn't paddle very well. Um, it what do you mean go by very that? Very fast. Well, there's the let's let, let's go from a bad surfboard, and the opposite is a magic surfboard, which <laughs> yeah. is the best surfboard of your life, where you don't have to think. Like, <laughs> yeah, a right. magic surfboard is something where you just surf. And everything that goes on in your mind automatically transposes into your turns and your carbs, and and uh, it's just it's just all instinct. So a bad surfboard is something you, where you've got to think and go. Oh, it's hard to paddle, mm. you know. So you're not catching the waves very easy. Then you then you finally get into your feet and the board's unstable, so you're already wobbling. Then you go down to the bottom of the wave and then all of a sudden you've got to, you're trying to do a turn and you can't do the full turn. You've got to nurse it. <laughs> so everything that makes a magic surfboard, it fails that test. Bad <laughs> surfboard. Right. You're never going to learn on, you're never going to progress. But in this day and age now, because all the shaping has been computerised, it's pretty hard to get a bad surfboard right. unless you were shaping it yourself off a blank and didn't have the experience to, to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, what makes your surfboards so highly sought after other than being in the game for so long and having a great network? Is your product just something well, completely different? It, it's, I've, it's, it's, I'm more of a boutique brand, you know. I don't do a lot of surfboards because I don't like to work very hard. I like to think I like, I'm, I'm at, in my old age. I'd like to think, you know, less work, uh, less work, a little bit more money. But it, the money doesn't even bother me now. I've gone through it. That's one of my biggest problems in life. Money doesn't mean much to me at all. When I need it, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, if I don't need a lot of money, well, maybe I won't work so hard. But part of what I – there's something in me that a lot of people have been trying to work out for maybe 30 years is that I have I, – I'm able to see ahead. I'm able to look mm. ahead and go, what is a surfboard going to look like in five years? <clears throat> mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyhow, and I've always pushed the limits – I've lived on an I've lived on edge my whole life. I mean, in the old days, we had two speeds in a car. Stop flat out. We used to time ourselves records. We used to drive like maniacs, live like maniacs. But also, there was the constant evolution of the surfboard from, say, the long what we call logs now, the longboard, to the modern day surfboard. And I I was really blessed to be at that age, at that place with certain shapers where I was actually able to grow. And I've always been able to conceptualize and visualize really easily anything in, on any subject. So I've, I've applied that to surfboards and I can actually see, I wake up in the middle of the night some nights and I see certain just weird mm. shapes and that. I watch a lot of sci-fi because I love looking at all the spaceships. Mm. I like looking at the wing. I like looking at the designs and the curves of things. Um, I also like the technical side. I'm a Formula One freak. I follow Formula One like 
you know, uh, it's just <laughs> I just love it because of the technical side, you know, how, right. having to put thousands and thousands of variables together. Yeah. <laughs> so in between this experience and this gut feel, I, I'm sort of futuristic and I go way beyond boundaries that most people have never been. You know, and I've been towing with Ross Clark Jones waves from 15 to 25 feet uh, in Victoria. We've got a couple of spots that uh, are just unbelievable board testing. So we spent 10, 12 years. Wow. Like in, in 20 to 30 foot surf, howling onshore, two degrees on a jet ski with, with goggles and stuff like that, testing boards, testing fins working out what's real or what's not. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> when you start surfing big waves, you got to be truthful from your body, from your material, from the technical side, everything. If you, if there's a 1% mistake, Ross and Ross, this Ross Clark Jones and I have been talking, we're going to, we're going to do some stories and stuff of some sort of, what do we call it? Uh, probably some sacred, some sacred times that we're going to talk about. And what that'll show people was is these lunatics going out in a storm that the wind's 80 kilometres an hour onshore. It's 20 to 20 foot plus, but the second wave's clean. <laughs> right. So we'll go through the chop. Wow, oh, this is five mil wetsuits and everything. And we, we're out there on the frontier on the cutting edge. And we've just been talking it about lately that, you know, if we made a mistake, you're dead. I mean, there's no way out. If you make a mistake, you're dead. So when I design boards um, and I've got all these different things I look at, boats and that, we went to deep concaves and we went to a really a, a whole new type of surfboard. Being able to surf a, a small 5 foot 10 surfboard in 30 foot surf, 20 foot surf. So those times there, putting your life on the line, there's nothing better than coming out of a session and and having a board that all of a sudden was just it was just a vision in my mind it was just a you know and all of a sudden i've been able to transpose that into foam and then we've got the right fins everything when when those days click and you've worked really hard for six months every three days just putting your life on the line and then all of a sudden you come out of the water there's that day and i've got a i think i'm going we're going to do stories all those different days and the progressions of what we did and how friends and we trust each other implicitly the trust between your partner and that's your best friend it's it's you're nearly you're nearly married to him <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. um so I, I, i've been very blessed that i've had this really extra friend who's the most extreme nearly extreme human being on the planet he's just has no fear of it, you know, any sort of If a tsunami came through a foot, he would be just going, wow, can I get barrel? What's his I'd name? probably have a heart attack and you wouldn't have to worry about it. But he used to get Ross Clark Jones. Ross Clark Jones. No he's idea. a renowned big wave, you know, anyhow, he's won the Yeti right now, anyhow. So he's a certified lunatic and um, <laughs> he has no fear of waves, but wow. he has a fear of sharks and I don't. <laughs> It's like it's not like it's just something missing, and uh, so you know we, we'll have just two eccentrics together. You got to try and imagine it's eighty kilometres an hour. It's pouring rain. It's hailing. We've just come in from a session. We're loading the ski. We're in our, all our wetsuits, gloves, hoods, and that, mate. And we are driving home. All we can talk about is the second wave, the third wave. What about the back fin? You know, and so that's that's the creative. The creative <laughs> part and that has i've got all of now you know it's it's i'm trying at the moment i'm i'm in a keezer and i'm trying to rebuild my body because uh, ross was on survivor last year right and he hurt his leg he broke it uh, all the ligaments so he hasn't been able to surf so we're both i think he's 53 or 54 i'll be 67 next year wow and i'm on this program mate I'm going towing next year. I've, I've got <laughs> another design that I've just pulled through, and I've got some people testing, and it might be a it might be another world breakthrough. So I've I've had world breakthroughs before on on design. 
So it's a, it's a pretty complex thing, but it's just part of the DNA. And, and uh, uh, if I didn't surf, I wouldn't shape. If I didn't shape, I probably wouldn't surf. Mm, you know, mm, mm. it's one of those things. That, you know, and that's why I've, I've got had some really bad physical stuff in the last twelve months, which is uh, you know I, I've really struggled to surf. Mm. And um, you got a very relaxed cool. surfing style, Maurice. Mar- Mar- yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't watch a lot of surfers, but seeing you. Uh, you don't, well, I don't know whether it's a later thing in life, but you're not really f- flicking your arms around like a wild man. You're just sitting on the back there, just just pushing that board along with your back foot. Oh, it, it's, it's impressive. Just, well, it's sort of, as you get older, I used to do all that other stuff. You know, I was a, a champion surfer and, yeah. you know, Australian teams and considered, you know, I was at, a, a, at probably, a, oh, no, no, probably wasn't an elite level of surfing in France. Mm. You know, I sort of built a bit of a reputation as a tube rider there, any size, anywhere. So wow. the surfing's always been incredibly strong. And that's what I've found in the last 12 months, that the body started really succumbing to mm. mentally and physical to, to a lot of the adversity that I've been through. But the great news is today you're speaking to someone who's, you know, he's just put his life on the line again. It's sort of funny you know, going for to be a counsellor and trying to get some real change. But the, the way forward, I'm really excited about <laughs> new designs. You know, I've got businesses in California and France and Japan and Brazil and Hawaii. And uh, I can't wait to get vaccinated and get out there again. Oh, my God. Because that really is, that's part of my family. My family, uh, yeah, everyone I work with worldwide, I've known for thirty plus mm, years, mm. you know, even longer. You know, so it's it's a it's a fan, and you know, I'm, I've never been so excited about the future. You know, about being able to help, being able to be, you know, the Uncle Fossil. And, uh, <laughs> I know, love some it. Business stuff going on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah you know, I've got some really, really amazing stuff to do in the next 10 years. And, you know, we've got a pandemic. A lot of people are really, really struggling with it. Mm. And uh, all I can say is, man, when you look at the rest of the world right now, mm-hmm. we're an amazing job. There, there, we're, we're, there's nowhere else in the world you would rather be from a pandemic point of view or, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm watching mm. the rat. There's a bloody rabbit out there. There's a llama just ran by. <laughs> there's a there's, you know, here come the ducks. Are you I'm, sure they're there, Morris? Are they there or are they not there? I've got... <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah. <laughs> I thought oh, you might be seeing ducks. things. <laughs> hey, Morris, we've got to, <coughs> we've got to um, moved out. In- I've got to keep moving on with the show. You were very spot on when you said, where do you want to start? How much, how much time have you got? Because... Your life has been so full that yeah, I, I feel like I've, I've robbed you of, of time. But um, I really appreciate your time and I'm so thankful no, mate, you're it's, here. You know, I just, just you know, like if, if people follow me in that, it, you know, even on Instagram and that, I do a little bit of business. Cool. But, uh, you know, I just, I just thought I'd pull this one up and then with this... <laughs> I didn't hear that last bit. The internet just dropped what out it a bit. Is. It says healing. Okay. So just I'll leave you on this thing here. Okay? Go for it. I posted this other day on Instagram. Healing doesn't mean the damage never existed. It means the damage no longer controls our lives. Hmm. Mm. Do you get that? I certainly do. Healing doesn't mean damage never existed. You know, so we, we're we carrying a lot of damage. Mm. I'm carrying a lot of stuff. And it's working your way through where it doesn't control your life every day. Where if you have a dark moment that you've got a process in place that you can go and talk to someone, mm. you might have to have a pill. You might have to go home and go to sleep. But you actually have an action it gets you through that so that you're not a slave to your past and that you you, you don't develop victim. You get that victim yep. 
Yep. Yeah. We talk about it's it quite a bit, Morris. Mentality, and that is a really yep. – Yeah. We so do. that's why I thought that's I'd brilliant. just leave you on that. And that's We've got a lot of that coming up. We need a lot of uncles standing by to help. Yeah. Yeah. Morris, I appreciate your time so much. It's been a pleasure to be able to spend the last 40 minutes with you and, and the listeners. No worries, mate. Anytime, anytime, bring it back. We might yeah. br- we might get you back when those I've titles got, kick off. I've got some film. Oh, mate, I, I did just so you know, I've got a, a, a book being written. I've got some a group of people in Hollywood, in, um, in Malibu, right. where we'll be doing a series on my life, it looks like, and... Uh, they were getting ready to sign off that this was the last chapter. But obviously, I think there I think- might be a chapter or two <laughs> left in the old fossil there. I think you got a few more. <laughs> Mate, it's a pleasure having you, Morris. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you so much, Unc. Okay, mate. Thanks for having me on. You're more than welcome. Take care, everybody, and stay safe.